So uh, let me just uh, start out by introducing today's uh, speaker. So first of all, welcome to everyone for joining today's CDY lecture. This is uh, the second in the series of talks focusing on GRBs and GRB afterglows. So today's talk is, uh, the title of today's talk is Experimental Theory, TEV GRB Afterglows, and will be given by Mithya Kangulian of uh, Rikyo University. So just a quick introduction. Dmitri is also is no stranger to this group. Uh, he's currently an associate professor, uh, Department of Physics at Rikyo University. Uh, his PhD was in theoretical physics from Moscow Engineering Physics Institute with Professor Sergei Bogovalov and uh, Stas Kellner. And the main result from the thesis was the interpretation of the Crab Nebula torus structure uh, by the impact of anisotropic pulsar wind. So subsequently he moved to uh, Max Planck Institute uh, in Heidelberg in 2004, where he joined uh, Felix's group in MPIK and worked with Felix and Valenti. Um, and, and at that time, it's very interesting. And one of his uh, highest cited papers was on VHE emission, studies of VHE emission from the uh, binary, TEV binary LS5039. Uh, Dmitri is uh, currently a member of the HES collaboration and his, he has been working on HES GRB studies and that's going to be the topic of uh, today's talk. So I also want to take this opportunity to remind everyone to explore the CDY initiative website and uh, for talks and for the recordings from the past. And if you're not on our mailing list and would like to join, please just email one of the co-chairs of this uh, initiative and I will put the links in the in the chat, uh, just email us and we'll add you. So let's thank you, Dmitri, for giving us this talk. And so let me let me just say, let's just get started. So you have the screen. So please go ahead. And again, so okay. might, we are recording this. So you 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 are not in full screen mode, <coughs> right? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's it's my great pleasure to participate in uh, this virtual uh, university institute give a talk. So uh, I will talk, uh, the title of my uh, talk is Experimental and Theory PBG uh, GRP Afterglow. And I will mostly focus on experimental results since we just had two very good talks on the theory side by Jenna and Thivir. And I have little uh, to add to these contributions. And here you have uh, the outline of my talk. So first I will start with, uh, with a short introduction, why we uh, wish to detect GRBs in the very high energy. After that, I will uh, briefly discuss the attempts to uh, detect about uh, well, detection of uh, GRB afterglow with Fermilat, and I will continue uh, with detection of GRBs in the very high energy regime, with currently with S and Magic. After that, I will a uh, little discuss modeling of GRB afterglow, and I will finish with discussing the implication of detection of GRB 19. 0829N with S and with I finish with my summary. Of course, the the importance of uh, detection of GRBs in the very high energy region is uh, related to uh, the acceleration of very high energy particle. And if in the non-relativistic regime we believe we have a very good acceleration mechanism, which is uh, diffusive shock acceleration, and we now understand this process quite well. So we have a very simple idea how this mechanism can work. For a detailed theoretical and numerical simulation, we can estimate uh, the spectrum of non-thermal particles which emerges from this process. We can uh, calculate the acceleration time, so the time required to accelerate particles to a given energy. And if this picture works quite well in the non-relativistic regime, uh, particles 
which if the shock moves through the physical particles, simply have not enough time to get isotropized. And this entire cartoon gets broken. A jerby of the glow represents maybe the most simple realization of relativistic shock. In this case, the forward shock propagates through uh, interstellar medium, well, stellar wind, and in addition to this very simple uh, idea of the shock propagating, there is also a self similar hydrodynamical solution obtained by Blanford McKee. And based on this solution, we can predict quite well the key hydrodynamical uh, conditions at the shock. And uh, when we detect only synchrotron emission from such shocks, uh, there's always some uncertainty. We cannot uh, resolve uh, the ambiguity between uh, the magnetic field strength and particle energy. And on the other hand, if we detect another radiation component produced by the same particle, this should dramatically reduce uh, the allowed parameter space. And therefore, detection of and Ross Compton emission from uh, relativistic shocks from uh, afterglow, Jerby afterglow, is very attractive uh, problem or task. And uh, also, there is very basic idea that the synchrotron component cannot extend beyond the burn off limit. So the uh, limit, which is set by the condition, then synchrotron cooling is faster than acceleration time. And it's very convenient that the maximum synchrotron energy does not depend on the magnetic field strength. And this is considered as a quite general uh, limit, which can be uh, changed only by uh, a relativistic motion of the production side by uh, Doppler boosting. And since we know from uh, the Blanford McKee solution the bulk tolerance factors, which, which we can expect from the shock, uh, from the shock, then we can uh, put a constraint on the maximum synchrotron energy. And uh, this limit does not uh, estimate show that uh, the synchrotron component should not extend to the very high energy regime. And therefore, detecting synchro uh, inverse content emission in the TV band is a very important task. However, uh, well, historically, if we first uh, detected GV emission uh, from Jerby's with Fermilat, and it's not a surprise because Fermilat is almost ideal instrument to study Jerby. There's even gamma burst monitor on board of Fermi. Fermi has large field of view, so easy to catch uh, many Jerby's operates in the TV band where we can expect both synchrotron and inverse Compton emission uh, from GRB prompt afterglow phases. And well, the, the only problem of uh, GRB is that it has a relatively small uh, collection area, which is unavoidable for spaceborne instrument and which is damaged its sensitivity from flaring sources. And here you can see uh, a sky map reported by the thermal collaboration, where you can uh, see more than 2,000 uh, GRBs detected with GBM, and approximately 8% of them were also detected uh, with thermal LUT. And uh, well, there are hundreds, well, in this map, there are 160 of long GRBs and only 16 of short derbies. And natural question is what is uh, seen with Fermi LUT? And there were several very good papers by uh, the Fermi collaboration. And here you can see a summary of one of them, which was published in 2018. Basically, the idea is very simple. We select a 
a subset of GRBs which uh, were detected uh, in X-ray with XRP and uh, were in the field of view of Fermilab. And in this way, uh, we can, on one hand, put uh, estimate the extrapolation of the X-ray spectra to the GV band. On the other hand, we have IVA detection, or we can derive an upper limit in the GV band, and we can uh, compare uh, these two expected and uh, detected, let's say, fluxes, and there were 386 GRBs and one more than 1,000 of different time intervals. And here you can see the figure from uh, this study. And the red triangles are the GRB in which the extrapolation of the X-ray flux appeared below uh, the uh, Fermilat upper limit. And the blue triangles are both uh, GRB where the extrapolation appeared to be above the thermal limits and the stars uh, detection. And as it follows from, from this uh, picture, uh, there was no uh, evidence in the thermal data uh, that there is some in the GV band, there is some significant excess uh, above the extrapolation uh, from uh, the X-ray band. Here uh, you can see another uh, figure from this figure uh, from this paper where one also uses the cotton index, uh, and it can be seen uh, that uh, we expect naturally expect the detection from GRB, which have hard X-ray spectrum, but uh, it's also natural that, that uh, there could be a break in the spectrum. So these uh, estimates with hard X-ray spectrum may significantly overestimate the GV flux. And the question is, if this study rules out uh, the, the, the presence of the inverse quantum emission in the GV band, and of course not. And to uh, understand the implication, we should consider some uh, physical model for the GRP afterglow. And here you can see a very famous page which illustrates supernova explosions uh, in which uh, we uh, well, the relativistic outflow is produced. These outflows propagates first. Uh, through ejecta and then uh, through compressed medium. And we, GRB uh, after glow emission, we attribute it to the particle acceleration at the forward shock of this outflow. And uh, as I uh, already mentioned, there is a very good self similar solution obtained by Blanford Mikey. However, for uh, like one zone calculations, we need just single parameter and this single parameter can be obtained uh, from just the consideration of energy. Then we uh, equal the explosion energy to the energy in the shell, which is consists of the internal energy of uh, the shocked matter uh, multiplied by the bulk. Lorentz factor. So, and using this relation, we can uh, obtain a dependence of uh, the bulk Lorentz factor of uh, the shell and uh, get uh, estimate for the key uh, physical parameters in the, the shock plasma, such as plasma internal energy, for example. And there is quite important point uh, uh, in this solution. It appears that the bulk Lorentz factor depends very weakly on the physical parameters. For example, here you can see uh, the uh, dependence of the Lorentz, of bulk Lorentz factor on uh, the explosion parameters uh, for the case of uh, 
forward shock propagating in homogeneous medium. And you can see here this very weak dependence one eighth. Uh, so we basically, uh, this says us that we cannot change dramatically the Lorentz factor. So the plan for Mackey a solution dictates us the Lorentz factor dependence on time, and we have very little freedom to change it. And if we use uh, this, uh, this solution, we can try to estimate if uh, we see some uh, gamma uh, GV photons above uh, the synchrotron burn off limit. And again, here is a plot from uh, Baker by Magic Collaboration, uh, which uh, where one reported Fermilab observation of GRB 19014C, which was uh, also detected with magic. And uh, we can see that there are several photons which appear above uh, the maximum synchrotron energy. And this either uh, requires presence of uh, inverse Compton emission or some very efficient acceleration pro process, which uh, accelerate particles more efficiently than we expect. And uh, there were uh, also, even in this case, then we uh, see some photons uh, above the synchrotron burn off limit, still the, the, the thermolat fluxes appear on the extrapolation of the X-ray spectra as shown in this figure. And basically we just extrapolate hard X-ray flux. We precisely get uh, to the level of uh, thermolat emission as it shown here. However, still there could be some component which emerges just above, just at the top of the Fermi band. And actually it was uh, suggested uh, that there is some alteration evidence for that uh, back in uh, 2013, uh, then Tom and Foster uh, reported uh, Thermilat observation of GRB 13047.8, and they argued that these highest energy points, more or less at 10 GV, they appear above the, the uh, above the uh, above the level of uh, points at the uh, lower energies, and therefore they they argued there could be this could be are considered as a sign of a hardening of the uh, GV spectra and inverse Compton emission is the most natural interpretation for this hardening. But this could be a very uh, low significance result. And since we, we see some hints for hardening of this spectrum let's say 10 GV, uh, Chernkov detectors could be very good proofs uh, for existence of this additional component. And there were long hunt for detecting GRBs in the TV band. And here you can see a photo of S telescope arrays. And in the left bottom corner, you can see a summary plot for observation of GRBs with S. And here you can, well, on a bit arbitrary divide the, 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 the GRBs. Here you can see the, these red GRBs, which are, which are called prompt. And uh, the cases then one started observation after 10 to three seconds. These are referred as afterglow, but this is somewhat arbitrary uh, division. And often the prompt 
phase uh, end much earlier. And also you can see here three GRVs which were detected and published in the literature. Two of them were detected with HES and one with MED. And actually it took really long, long time to detect GRBs uh, with uh, Cherenkov detectors. And there are a few reasons for that. On one hand, um, I'm sorry, I cannot change my slide. I don't know why. Ah, it's okay. So on one hand, uh, uh, we expect that uh, GRB um, contains a relativistic outflow, so it should be easier to produce high energy emission. But on the other hand, it means that we, we are dealing with highly variable sources and it might be simply very complicated to point trend of detectors in the right time in the right direction. Also, GRBs are bright non-thermal sources, but so far we are sure that, that this bright emission is produced by synchrotron mechanism. And in this case, uh, inverse Compton can be suppressed because of strong magnetic field or attenuated because of uh, strong internal absorption because a low energy synchron photons can uh, provide target for uh, gamma gamma attenuation. And there is another extremely important uh, point which is uh, related to the fact that we mostly detect adjourbies from cosmological distances and uh, means uh, that we are uh, trying to detect sources which can be heavily uh, absorbed by evil uh, attenuation. And here you can see the threshold energies of uh, uh, all has observation of uh, GRBs. And uh, you can see that, that, that uh, mostly we, uh, at least we, try to detect them above 100 GV. And here, uh, evil absorption can be already very significant. Here you can see a few plots uh, which illustrate uh, on one hand the impact of uh, evil absorption on uh, EV emission from GRBs from sources uh, on cosmological distances and uh, in the right top corner, you can see the distribution of GRBs by redshift and uh, isotropic luminosity. And it can be seen that mostly we detect GRBs from redshift, let's say two. And in the left bottom uh, corner, you can see a figure which shows that already at uh, redshift of, let's say, of zero point few, the gamma uh, gamma attenuation on eBay is very significant, and basically we absorb all the emission above uh, let's say five hundred GV, uh, uh, five hundred GV, and therefore we we are left very narrow band where we can detect the signal. And for example. Here you can see these three gerbies which were detected with uh, Chernkov telescopes. And you can see that two of them were, well, they were actually all three of them were quite close with uh, the redshift significantly less than one. However, uh, already for uh, the redshift of let's say 0 0.4, the Attenuation very significant. And basically, we uh, now have just single case of uh, a single case. Then uh, the Ebel attenuation is relatively small, and which is GRB 1908-29A. And uh, GRB absorption makes two damages. First of all, it makes spectrum steep, and it's hard to detect these sources, but also it brings uncertainty on uh, which are related uh, to uh, our 
lack of precise knowledge about the properties of eBail because we are interested in the intrinsic uh, spectra of the sources. So we need to apply uh, eBail the absorption, but since the opacity is not precisely known, it brings additional uncertainties and it means that it's very hard to reconstruct the intrinsic uh, gamma ray uh, spectrum, even from uh, moderately absorbed gerbies. And these are quite uh, complicated problems for studying uh, GRB in the very high energy regime. So far, we have detected, uh, let's say, between four and six GRBs in the very high energy regime. So currently, there are two detections with HES between two and four detection with magic and Veritas has not yet detected any GRB. Here you can see a complete list of uh, GRB detected or with um, hints of detection in the very high energy region. Uh, the very first GRB which was detected in the very high energy region is GRB 160821. B, which was recently uh, reported by magic collaboration. It was just three sigma detection from relatively nearby short GRB. But since this is just a three sigma detection, probably uh, we would be a little careful about the implication of these detections. Uh, then uh, there are three GRBs which were significantly detected and these detections are now reported in the literature. These, uh, the first of them is GRB 18.0.720B, which was detected with five sigma significance by HES. The first occurred at directly 0.65 and it was detected late in the afterglow phase, 10 hours after the trigger. It was very uh, interesting finding, which proved that we can keep observing GRB for a very long time. Then uh, MAGIC uh, detected GRB in 2019. That was a very high significant detection with more than 50 sigma. It was a long GRB uh, detected during first 20 minutes after the trigger and after that has detected a very important I believe event there be 19 or 8 high significant detection with more than 20 stigma uh, it was a long derby which occurred at very small distance so basically we, we looked uh, at uh, this event from one gigaparsec distance, the redshift 0.08. Thanks to this small distance, the eBay attenuation was quite modest, so we could recover the spectrum in a very broad range from 180 GV to 3.3 GV, and has could detect the signal during three consecutive nights, so starting from four to 56 hours after the trigger. And now uh, there are two detection of therapies reported by uh, magic collaboration uh, in astronomy telegrams. Uh, one is relatively small significance detection long therapy at rate of 0 0.43. And another, Quite interesting case, high significance detection of very distant GRB at rate of 1.1. Uh, In this case, the evil attenuation should be very strong, of course. So now I will just briefly discuss uh, these three uh, published detections. So in the first case, uh, here you can see the, the sky map reported by the HES collaboration. So and in the left top corner, you can see the summary of this jury that was a very 
Sprite Jerby with uh, isotropic luminosity exceeding 54 ergs and uh, has to detect a single point from uh, 10 hours at 10 hours after the trigger, but we could recover the spectrum and which was measured between 100 and 400 GV. And we could also estimate the intrinsic spectrum applying the eval absorption procedure. And we obtained that uh, the spectrum, uh, intrinsic spectrum is very hard. It can be even harder than two. And uh, since there was a single detection, we can look at the light curve light curves obtained in other energy bands and also we can look at the uh, photon indices and it can be seen that basically uh, all the photon indices in the x-ray Fermi uh, they are quite close to the two and the, the flux level is also comparable in the TV and X-ray band. So it means uh, that in this specific case, we may uh, uh, like a straight line from X-ray to uh, TV and provide a reasonable fit for the entire uh, emission. And uh, well, uh, so on one hand, we clearly detect photons above the synchronous burn off limit. And which we believe cannot be produced by the synchron mechanism. On the other hand, we don't see any TV component emerging uh, above the extrapolation from uh, the X-ray band. Just a single line bit provides quite good approximation for this spectrum. Here you can see. Uh, the, the, the result obtained by magic collaboration uh, from GRB 1901-14C. Again, you can see here uh, light curves obtained in X-ray optical uh, GV with thermal light and also green points uh, represent the light curve obtained with magic. Uh, again, uh, we can see that the, 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 the slopes in all energy bands are similar, TV and X-ray uh, decay in, a, in the same way. And uh, here, uh, magic collaboration reported uh, that there is evidence for uh, merging of uh, the inverse Compton component uh, as shown in this figure. So there is uh, this thermal detection in the second minutes after the trigger, which falls slightly below uh, the, the straight line between the X-ray and TV band. However, in the third minutes, it looks like uh, a straight line provides a better fit uh, than this two component fit. And the inverse graph may be if not a very robust observational proof of existence of inverse component component. Then we are coming to uh, another case which was uh, detected. Uh, has and it was reported recently in science. So th this was a very special derby because it was very nearby. In this case, uh, we basically uh, can robustly estimate the impact of evil absorption. We can robustly absorb the spectrum, but unfortunately this was quite prompt luminosity uh, being a few times 10 to 50 ergs only. 
Uh, however, it still has to detect the emission during three consecutive nights. During the first night, the detection was very significant, with more than pigment detection. In the second night, also, it was more than five sigma detection. So this just single observation can be considered a detection uh, for this derby. In the third night, the detection prob detection significant drop below uh, three sigma, but still this could be considered as two sigma large or so three sigma uh, three night detection of derby. Mm -hmm. uh, so here you can see spectrum uh, reported by the collaboration. And of course, in the first night, uh, we have a very good spectrum, which uh, spans between, let's say, 200 GB and 3 dB. And we could obtain the intrinsic because it will have quite good control on the eval absorption because of the source proximity. And we obtained spectra, intrinsic spectra, which appeared to be remarkably similar to the measured in band. Um, are there problems? So your sound is cutting out a little. Yeah. We're having. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know if the internet is weak. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So I, but I, I, I will continue if it's not too bad. Uh, so uh, we got uh, intrinsic uh, TV. Uh, spectral indices, which are very similar to the X-ray uh, uh, X-ray uh, photon indices, uh, which are shown here in this figure. So basically, here are the X-ray photon indices, and here are the intrinsic uh, TV uh, indices, and they are basically identical. And if we look at the light curves, again, similar to the derby detected with magic, we uh, see almost identical decays in the X-ray and TV bands. So we could get five independent TV points uh, for the light curve, and we could derive uh, uh, the decay, uh, decay slope. And again, they are uh, the obtained values in X-ray and TV uh, bands are um, almost identical. So we have very consist consistent picture uh, that TV and X-ray uh, spectra are very similar. So they have similar slopes and the flux level decay in the same way. And again, uh, we can see that, 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 that a similar uh, decay in TV and X-ray also seen in uh, the magic gerby. Uh, a short summary of all uh, the test results for this gerby. And basically for all the achievement, the close proximity of gerby was, was critical. So well, this we could not get very broad TV spectrum. And also unlikely that, that we can get very uh, long span, let's say, light curve. And also, thanks to this proximity, we could robustly absorb the TV slopes and X-ray slopes um, identical. And if we look at the modeling, Site, then, then we try to model uh, uh, 
no thermal emission from gerbis, we have to uh, consider several independent processes. So first of all, we need to deal with aerodynamical pollution. Then we get uh, the, the, the ratio between the key uh, thermodynamical parameters. And for this, we have very good uh, lens of my key solution, which can uh, for sure be used for one zone estimate. Then another point uh, uh, that we need some way to describe the microscopical processes which uh, take place at the shock. And this is really a great zone. Uh, and we cannot, well, there's, there was this talk by, by Shania a month ago, two months ago, where he explained a model how we can consider these processes. However, well, still uh, there could be some uncertainties there, and this is still a little gray zone. Uh, and this reminds which fraction of energy goes to thermal, which goes to uh, non thermal particles, and which goes to magnetic field. And using this logical description, we can uh, compute. Uh, Creation and then apply Doppler boosting. And what is good again, uh, that uh, if we look at the blendsford marquee solution, at least for the bulk load structure, there's very little freedom we can, uh, in changing these parameters. So basically, it's determined by uh, the uh, time since the trigger. And then there is much more freedom in uh, tuning magnetic field strength. And finally, what is also important in principle, uh, then we try to compare TV emission uh, produced by inverse Compton uh, through inverse Compton mechanism and uh, hard X-ray emission. These two components can be produced by uh, particles of similar energy unless we assume uh, some very uh, weak, for example, magnetization, then, then we can effectively separate these regions. And of course, then we are trying to model in, uh, inverse quantum emission. We should not forget about uh, klein china cutoff and internal gamma gamma absorption, which come together, basically the conditions for klein china and uh, gamma gamma absorption are the same. So here you can see uh, the, the cross-section for these two processes. It can be seen that they are important, uh, more or less in the same energy band. However, if uh, the impact of the internal absorption can be changed, for example, if we assume larger energy or uh, explosion energy, then uh, the, the radius of the shock is larger. And then uh, this effectively decreases uh, the optical depth, and therefore the impact of uh, gamma gamma absorption. Uh, the Klein-Schinner cutoff is all, always present, and basically the only way to uh, uh, decrease the impact of Klein-Schinner cutoff is to assume higher Lorentz factor. And here in this uh, simple configuration, you can see the impact part of uh, the klein Shina cutoff for two different bulk Lorentz factors. It can be seen that for small uh, bulk Lorentz factor of a few, the TV spectrum gets steeper. And it's very hard to reproduce uh, the same slope in the X-ray and TV bands. So uh, in um, has collaboration reported some simple uh, modeling, so one considered a five parameter model and one tried to use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo fitting and to reproduce both TV and X ray data, and it came out very complicated in framework of the considered model to, to get uh, the X ray and TV spectra produced. Uh, uh, 
TV emission produced by synchronous source content emission, and it looked that it's much easier to uh, elevate the synchronous burn off limit and uh, uh, feed X ray and TV data by a single broad uh, synchronous component. This is, of course, very basic feeding with, with just very small uh, model. And uh, we cannot exclude that there are some, some more radical parameter space. And uh, shortly after the publication of this paper, uh, one put in archive uh, of model for this GRB. And here you can see a corner plot from this model, which includes 12 parameters. Again, uh, Mark chain Monte Carlo feeling, and uh, one could uh, reproduce much better uh, the X ray and TV emission in framework of this model. Uh, one had to assume weak magnetization, so this separates uh, the bands which are responsible for the TV and X ray emission. One uh, considered effectively a two zone model with contribution both from the forward and reverse shock, which uh, gave some uh, softening, small softening of the X ray uh, spectrum. And what is interesting still with this large parameter model, one could not very well reproduce the TV spectrum. And this seems to be a general problem of synchronous self Compton because uh, planning effect makes uh, the spectrum, uh, inverse Compton spectrum hump-like, and it's very hard to reproduce uh, broad Paolo uh, emission in the TV band. And here you can see a uh, spectral energy distribution from Renia's paper, which was shown in Renia's and uh, previous talks uh, recently. And uh, uh, sorry, sometimes I have problem changing slide. Like now. Yeah, sorry. And uh, is it is it easy to confirm a Paolo very high energy spectrum from in GRB? Uh, to get uh, this uh, measurement, we need very broad. Uh, we we need broad TV spectrum, and for that we need weak EBL absorption because once EBL absorption is significant, few TV, uh, then. Uh, the, the, first of all, it's hard to measure the spectrum, then it's hard to uh, the absorb it. And therefore, we need very nearby GRB uh, to, again, check if uh, the, the, the TV spectrum is how low. And let's say uh, we need the GRB closer than the zero point, closer than redshift 0.1. And actually, there are very little GRBs uh, with such close distance. For example, here you can see a distribution of uh, Swift GRBs with redshift, and it can be seen that there were only uh, five GRBs below 0 0.1, redshift 0 0.1. And it means that even if we very like it, still we need to, to wait several years uh, to 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 uh, detect a, a gerby with a distance a close enough distance to measure a, a broad TV spectrum. And here I, I got to my summaries. And uh, um, and basically, first of all. Uh, GRB is a very important detecting TV emission from GRB is very important because it can uh, help us understanding particle acceleration at relativistic shocks and uh, in particular it 
to a constrained amplification of the magnetic field and uh, acceleration of very high energy particles. And uh, also, uh, well, conventionally, we do not expect that synchrotron emission can extend uh, to TV band, even from PRBs. So basically, the, the Lorentz factor is very high, let's say 100. Still, we don't expect to uh, we don't expect to detect synchrotron photons above, let's say, 20 GeV, and therefore. Uh, very high energy band is a very good window to, to, to constrain the parameters. And in this way, uh, detection of GRB 19 or 829A uh, provide us with a unique chance because it was a very nearby explosion. So we could measure broad uh, TV spectrum. And uh, we obtained uh, that the TV spectrum is a Paulon with no signs of curvature in the spectrum. And in principle, these challenges, these spectral slope challenges, uh, the standard models for GRBs, those synchronous of predicts pump like uh, emission component. And in principle, we can, we can uh, elevate this difficulty by assuming some extreme conditions, for example, Weak magnetic field can help low radiation efficiency. Or we can uh, consider multi-zone models. With multi-zone models, it would be much easier to fit this kind of spectra. One can consider extreme models with uh, synchrotron only components. Or maybe one, one need to rethink uh, completely the, the uh, acceleration by uh, relativistic shock and for example, work by Shania or by Derishov and Iran provide an interesting attempt in uh, this direction. Uh, I think I, I'm out of my time, so thank you very much. If there are any questions, I can answer. Thank you. That was really excellent to get the summary of uh, all of the observations.